It has to do with uh, the time. And that is, of course, the uh, centenary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. And so we were looking ahead to 2021. We had various meetings in 2018 and, and after, and we wanted to see what we could contribute as scholars um, that might offer an alternative to what you're going to get from Beijing and what you're going to get from the Western newspapers. Yeah, and um, we were also, of course, fascinated by this story, right? It's a story of many metamorphoses. So the Chinese Communist Party changes a lot of time. T at times it changes course, uh, its, it's uh, leadership changes. And uh, we also thought that that's just a very, it's a fascinating story, but also a very important story for, 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 for today's readers to know. I think that's right. I mean, on the one hand, I think in Beijing, we're going to get sort of lots of celebrations about how, how the CCP has delivered China from whatever poverty and help, help you know, raise it again to become a great power and revive its culture. Uh, and these days in the West, uh, you know, it's predictable that there's going to be a lot of criticism of the CCP and of course, rightly so. Um, but I think what we could show is that this is a very complicated story. Um, you begin with, you know, a couple of bookish intellectuals in Shanghai in 1920. Um, and, you know, two decades later, they are in charge in Beijing and then do a lot of things. And now we are at a stage where China is reshaping the world, whether we like it or not, under the leadership of this particular party. So it's a story we need to know and we need to deal with. Our aim was really is to show the human side of this story through these individual histories. So rather than seeing it as a series of political decisions or struggles for power or this or that, we really wanted to bring out uh, the individual side of that, of the party's history, what it means to live with, in, under, above the party, um, uh, and sort of show that element. And I think it's the failure of approaching the party in that kind of way that helps explain at least some, I don't, you know, you don't even hostility, so the ignorance about the party, which makes it so easy to be hostile about it. One aspect here is probably also that um, obviously the Chinese Communist Party is one of the most powerful political organizations in the world, if not the, the most powerful organization world. And that obviously, of course, elicits, you know, feelings of fear and uncomfort. And, and people, of course, are uncomfortable about it. Also, of course, the Communist Party is so many things that it has real difficulty explaining what it stands for and what it wants and what are its ambitions. It might mean just look at the cont contemporary or current situation. It says it wants peaceful evolution, but it also, of course, you know, invests heavily in the military. So there's always a discrepancy of what, what the party says and what it does. And I think that also fuels into, a stol into hostility. I think it's important to keep in mind, too, that the party for long periods of time actually was rather popular uh, in Europe, especially, uh, but also in the United States. You know, it was popular because it was not the nationalists, which were a dictatorial regime and all that. In the 60s, um, you know, when I, in the 70s, when I went to university, a lot of people would have read Mao's book or would have not read Mao's book, but at least carried it in their pockets. And I <laughs> said, <laughs> uh, so it was a real sort of Maoism was a real foe. Hans has a really good point, which is today's negative view of China in the West has not always been that way. And as Hans just said, in the 60s and the 70s, there was a really positive view of China. And so the Western views of China have been cyclical. They've gone up, they've gone down. They've been unrealistic in both senses. And uh, in, they, they've, they thought China was too wonderful, then they think China's too horrible. And what basically is, uh, as we see it, the, we project our hopes and fears onto China. And this little book tries to subvert that activity by making putting a human face on each decade. Yeah. We don't really know how the party works very well, any of us. 
And it's the ignorance that's the problem. But we start with giving a sense of the diversity and change of the party as a beginning to break down that ignorance. I think sort of we, we, we came to realize more and more as we read and developed these stories is that we can see sort of four phases in the history of the Chinese Communist Party, beginning with revolutionary youth in Shanghai, borrowing from a European or Moscow type Marxism. Then it transforms into a peasant revolution in the 1930s in China that ends up taking power. And that becomes uh, an example to follow around the world, really. Very, very powerful. Um, and then a phase after Mao, when there is a reform period. Um, and then under Xi Jinping, more recently, uh, what we call a sort of, what we can see as a, as a counter reform period. So I think sort of that, that kind of schema of having four periods comes out in the book quite clearly. From those four phases, we hope that this book, through the 10 lives that are presented, that readers can get some sense of the world that Xi Jinping is operating in, that Xi Jinping will make better sense. Because based on these stories, we can see how Xi Jinping is running a counter-reformation mm -hmm. against the reforms of, of the uh, Deng and uh, Jiang Zemin period, which were a reaction to an earlier, which were a reaction to an earlier. This is something where the party has also evolved, that this becomes an experience that's become, you know, much more commonplace, I think, for people in the party as the party grew. It's become home to, to a lot of people, feel intensely. You know, they think the party is very personal to them. And I think that's also something to understand from our book. I think the comparison to make there is like living with, uh, with or within uh, the Catholic party. Uh, with Rome. Um, yeah. It's the same kinds of intensities of feelings. Of Just think about this chapter by our Chinese colleague, uh, Chang Tishun, you know, about this this actor, a female, very fem female movie star. And even though she gets criticized, you know, and she gets expelled and or is at this, at this uh, uh, you know, almost expelled, she, she, she really wants to belong to the party, despite everything the party has done to her. And, and that's really something. And a later chapter, one by the second of our Chinese-based authors, Xu Jilin, talks about an intellectual in the 1990s, Wang Yuanhua, and his his reflections and critique of the party. And they're really quite substantive critiques, but they are the 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 cri de coeur of a of, as Hans was suggesting. It's his party. It's it's not right. It's it's like a Catholic criticism of the church. And that's why we think in terms of that metaphor is helpful for uh, Westerners. Uh, the party is like the church. There's lots that, uh, uh, that the West can learn from the Chinese Communist Party, both positive and negative. And uh, for those who know American politics, back to the 1990s, it's the vision thing. They sell a story that is broadly popular inside China, and that story is nationalism and 100 years of uh, humiliation and that the Communist Party has saved everything. The short version of the story that you will get from Xi Jinping is China stood up under Mao, got rich under Deng Xiaoping, and will, is getting strong under Xi Jinping. And that plays to the home market very well. The negative lesson is that control begets insecurity. The more you control, the more you have to manipulate, the more you need to do. This is an insecure government, despite the fact it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things I think we should definitely not do is sort of underestimate some of the strengths uh, of the party. And uh, to me, it seems that also that there are cases in the book that uh, I think can underline this, that uh, the party has also been a learning organization. It learned from its mistakes, yeah, very systematically. Uh, it also looked at other cases in the world. It tried to learn from the Soviet Union and, and they drew some very, some clear conclusions from that. So this, this ability to learn from mistakes and failures and to change or reform its own ways, 
That is not necessarily the case with any with even with every party in the world, as we know very well. To succeed in 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 communist China today, the training that people go through, the knowledge that they accumulate, the experience that they accumulate, is absolutely tremendous. And I'm always, you know, when I talk to British officials or colleagues, even uh, at Cambridge, who go to China. They are always impressed by how much they know about everything, including us. And the reverse cannot be said. What we know about China is very limited. Uh, I think one, if we come to learn one thing, it is that we need to be much better at that um, and that we need to take their governance models, not the negative side of that, but where it is good. Uh, when what it has achieved in three decades of economic growth is actually spectacular. And there's one more point I, I'd like to add, um, and that is that, yes, the party controls, it's, it's overly controlling, that is a weakness, but the party does know what lives at the local level, including by using modern uh, AI technologies and social media. If I contrast that with uh, the lack of knowledge, for instance, about what many people in, in the UK thought about inequality, thought about Europe, um, the dismissal of those concerns as just those of the uneducated, the deplorables, as uh, Mrs. Clinton called them. You know, that's, that, I don't think that that would, kind of attitude would get you very far in the Chinese Communist Party. That is definitely something. To yeah, so true. I think it was a very conscious decision, deliberate decision, not to have something on the big leaders, because our take on the party was to highlight, you know, who 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 is, uh, uh, in a way, the party below the big leaders, who, who, because we thought the party, you know, gets its energy, its power, its its mobilization power, actually from the people on the ground. So we were interested more in the grassroots, the everyday experiences, the understanding what it means to be a party member, to, to make a career in the party, to fail in the party, 